the Fed is going to be forced, as they were in 2010 and as they were in 2019, to make a choice, you know, to pretend like they're this, you know, austere, responsible stewards of the monetary policy or turn on the printers and lower rates and keep the plates spinning a little longer. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics as we continue our coverage of the gold and silver world and quite excited and fortunate today as we have Craig Hemke of TF Metals coming back on the show to talk about a lot of the things that have been going on. Also going to recap his macro cast, which uh, Craig, you wrote that a couple of weeks ago, though so far off to a pretty accurate start. So plenty to talk about and great to have you on here. And how's everything going with you today? Nice to see you, my old friend. I'd say, old friend, how long have we known each other? It's got to be at least a decade now, doesn't it? It's It's been a couple of years, and yeah. uh, it was great to have you in the book a couple of years ago. And uh, I, I remember you used to have like hair that wasn't the same color as that background. <clears throat> I can hardly see. It's like it's like your hair blends in against those silver bars, Chris. I, I guess there is hair there. I, I, Who am I, I to talk? Got a nice silver shade these days, uh, some grays in there, which I guess is part of following the silver world. Is that that'll do it to you? But. Yeah. What What's your beard like these days? Is it still dark? What's that? The, what's your beard like? Do you, if you grew like a goatee, would it be silver too? So we got some gray in there too. So yeah, yeah. I call it transparent. I'll, I'll let it flow out for a little bit there. Nice. I I say they're transparent. They're not silver. They're transparent. That's what they are. That, that's so anyway uh, yeah, whatever hey nice to see you um yeah it's uh we're off to an interesting start uh to the year no doubt i you know i this site has been around now for over 12 years and i i don't know when it was 16 or 17 i began the habit of writing an annual forecast which is really it accomplishes two things it forces me to focus at the end of the year and think ahead and it gives me a way to kind of hold myself accountable by the end of the year. And then it's also really good food for the people that don't like me, um, you know, to pick at parts that don't go right, you know, and tell me what an idiot I am by the time we get to Christmas time. Um, but yeah, there it is. It's right. Um, it's always a public post. Anybody that wants to read it, you can go to my site, tfmetalsreport.com and just scroll down until you find it. It's actually probably easier just to go to Twitter uh at tf metals on twitter it's the it's a pinned tweet uh so if you find my profile page you can just it's right there the very first thing at the top of the page um it's i don't know it's longer than a usual post it's something i like i said it kind of gets me focused i start collecting charts you know a bunch of time to get to november and december start thinking about where we're going i always try to put it up and you know right after the first of the year and then we see where it goes. I it's funny this year, Chris. The main theme is um, you know the Fed is going to be forced, as they were in 2010 and as they were in 2019, to make a choice. You, you know to pretend like they're this you know austere, responsible stewards of the monetary policy, or turn on the printers and lower rates and keep the plates spinning a little longer. Uh, they made that choice in 2010. They made that choice in 2019. They're going to do it again this year. That was kind of a contrarian opinion when I was writing this thing six weeks ago, four weeks ago. And now, God, every day, it's not so contrarian anymore. They get more, more and more people kind of like Wall Street types yep. coming around to that opinion. And so that I don't like so much. I'd rather be, you know, in, in the contrarian camp, but, you know, it is what it is. And uh, I get, you know, it's not like I'm, some kind of Nostradamus, you know, coming up with original thoughts. I mean, all I'm doing is again, projecting forward this year based off what we've seen in these couple of comparable years in recent history. Yeah, that makes sense. And perhaps first question to dig in there, what are the chances you think it gets delayed this year? Obviously a lot of us in the silver community, we're kind of a little mind boggled when we heard 75 basis point increases uh, throughout last year. And many expected a pivot last year. Now we've been reminded, as you point out quite a bit in your column and podcast, that you know a lot of these things take longer than expected. Do you see any chance that this gets pushed out to 2024? 
I don't know if it'd go that long. And I don't think the Fed fund futures are expect are pricing that in. I mean, I think they're even the Fed fund futures are pricing in cuts by the fourth quarter of this year. Um, now, to your argument, though, what did I get wrong last year uh, with the macro cast? I thought that we'd be start they'd be starting to cut by the fourth quarter of last year and that gold would be uh, rallying back to its old all time highs by the fourth quarter last year. And it got pushed back three or four months, I guess. You know, we bottomed out in November and then rallied into the end of the year instead. And now we're kind of getting there a month later. Um, and what happened? Again, and this gets to your point, will the Fed be late to react? Well, they've been late to react, turning off the printers. You know, here inflation was picking up and all that stuff. And they were still, you know, even as late as 20, you know, December of 2021 talking about, oh, no, we're not hiking rates until 23. And then uh, they were obviously uh, late to react to start hiking rates. And part of that was probably due to the war starting. You know, they didn't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're behind the eight ball. And so here's the Fed with all their models. And, you know, they're always model this, model that, and based off this and based off that. They go off on this course that they've never done before. All these 75 basis point rate hikes. So they have no idea what they've done. They have no idea what the impact is going to be, you know, in the, over the next three to six months and nine, you know, the rest of this year, whatever. And so, yeah, I guess, you know, uh, they missed the boat turning off the printer. They missed the boat. They waited too long hiking rates and inflation got crazy. So maybe they'll miss the boat and they'll really drive the economy in the ditch. Not like just drive it off the road, but like, Boom, you know, over the edge, uh, into the ditch. Um, and if if that's the case, maybe that'd be good for us because you know, because then the reaction is going to be over the you know equally over the top again. You know, with trillions and trillions of new QE to restart the economy. My my, what I suspect is going to happen, Chris. And I'm sorry for the long answer, but um, you know, they talk about inflation and getting it back to three percent. You know. What are they talking about? They're talking about year over year CPI. And, and how should we think about year over year? Think of year over year CPI like a moving average. You know, if people are traders, <clears throat> what's a 50 day moving average? Well, it's the last 50 days of price. Right. And uh, you add a day and you lose a day. You add a day, you lose a day off the back end, right? What's the year over year inflation? Well, it's the last 12 months of monthly increases, right? Well, the first six months of last year were all these month over month increases that were like six, seven, eight, nine percent into June. So as those bars come off that moving average and are replaced with January through June of this year with month over month of flat or negative 0.1 percent or something like that, well, that annualized number by the summer is going to come crashing down from the six and a half percent it is now. And it's probably going to be in the three, three and a half percent range, maybe even lower. At that point, maybe I'm just cynical, but at that point, we're going to be at the June FOMC and Powell's going to sit there and say, well, and they're going to say, why are you suddenly cutting rates? And he's going to say, well, the economy's in the toilet. And look, we won. Fed funds are four and a half. Inflation is three. So we got all this room to cut. And they'll declare victory and how smart they are. That's anyway, that's how I suspect it'll all play out. And I think that's a large part of why the metals have been rallying since November. Yeah, I remember you mentioned that in your column a little while ago. And I thought mm -hmm. that was a very valid point, how we'll see some of those bigger numbers dropping out soon. And, you know, again, I think for I'm in Mexico, but as I hear and on my brief trips into the U.S. in the last year, I, it seems like people are feeling the inflation at this point in a way unlike we've seen before. Um, although here's an interesting one that I didn't hear much talk about. This is the transcript from mm -hmm. the Jerome Powell's last press conference back in December, which I know you heard, although obviously yeah. as riveting as that commentary can often be. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts on this because he's talking about a summary of economic projections Median projection for the appropriate level of Fed funds is 5.1% at the end of next year, which would be now be 2023. Yeah. But he says the median projection is 4.1% at the yeah. end of 2024, 2024, 3.1% at the end of 2025. So 
what you know we can talk about the timing but i mean essentially he's saying the same thing that you are and then this is what i thought was pretty wild that 3.1 percent still above the median estimate yeah. of its longer run value so i mean is the plan yeah. just to have a two and a half percent fed funds rate you know into perpetuity and that's going to keep inflation down I'm curious your thoughts on that one yeah, I think that's where they're probably headed. You know, it, as I wrote, keep that up for a second though, Chris, don't pull that off. I want to sure. actually, would you start scrolling back toward the top while I, I say this? Um, I, you know, the, the current guesses for uh, like the 10 year note interest rate, all the wall street guys are at like four and a half to 5%. It's at three and a half. Uh, I'd say, I bet it's going to two and a half by the end of this year because the economy is going down. Uh, that, Again, if you're going to keep Fed funds up at 5%, that's a historically inverted yield curve. So something's going to have to give. Um, if you scroll to the top of that that SEP, I mean, does that, that's just his press conference? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, at every quarterly meeting, March, June, September, and December, they put out their SEP. It's a reference there. Uh, summary of economic projections. Yep. And those are hilarious. Um, <laughs> because they're never right. Uh, I, you'd have to go, um, out of that. And maybe if, um, wherever you found that link, Chris, you might find a PDF to their summary of economic projections from the end of December. I, I don't mean to get us off on a tangent. The point is the fed has never, ever predicted a recession ever to my knowledge. I mean, I don't know, maybe they did in like 1981 because it was so obvious and they were trying to be honest. But the Fed never predicts reason. Even right now, uh, you listen to any of these goons, the Fed governors, and they'll say, oh, a baseline forecast this year is 1% GDP growth and uh, 5% inflation. And they're always wrong. There you go. SCI, right, scroll down, brother. There's like a little table. There it is. All right, can you zoom in? How do I put my glasses? Zoom in on the upper left. There's your economic projections. That's where that's there. That's what they project for 2023. Real GDP, 0.5%. Unemployment rate, 4.6. PCE, 3.1. Okay. And you can see uh, the difference from where they were in September. Okay. Little higher in unemployment, little higher in PCE. Uh, a little bit of a cut to this year's GDP. So they're getting there. But uh, most regular, you know, economic analysis or analysts are saying a, a recession this year. And the Fed is still clinging to this notion of positive GDP growth. Um, they're going to be wrong. The Fed, like I said, has never predicted a recession. But let me tell you what has predicted recession. Uh, all the regional Fed purchasing manager in disease, the PMIs, which we've got another batch here this week, and they're all negative. Chicago Fed, Philly Fed, Empire Fed, all these different regional Feds. You know what? The and They've been negative now uh, in the, like the regular uh, PMIs, like ISM, have been negative for five months. You know what? You want to know what is a perfect record in predicting recession? Those PMIs, they're, they're eight for eight. You know what the Fed is? O for eight. Or the yield curve, which is now fully inverted. What's a three-year, three-month T-bills up at like four some odd percent? And the long bonds at, you know, three percent, three and a half percent. You know what the yield curve is? A hundred percent, eight for eight. What's the Fed? Zero for eight. So uh, they can say what they want. Um, we'll just, uh, yeah. And, and again, this is the underlying theme of the, this year's forecast. As much as I hate to use the word patience, because... I feel like every time I do, there's somebody out there listening going, I've been patient for 12 years and I'm getting sick and tired of this freaking patient stuff. Um, yeah, me too, brother. Uh, you just, you got it. We're going to be range bound. We're going to go sideways for the first three, four, five months of this year, just like we did in these analogous years of 2010 and 2019. You're going to get thrown off if you try to swing trade and all this other stuff and try to time the market. By the back half of this year, all this economic stuff is going to be happening. The Fed's going to be talking about easing and cutting rates. It's going to be obvious. And that's when the metals are going to explode, just like they have in the past. And if you're impatient, you'll end up chasing. So um, hang in there and let it play out.
And it seems like we've already seen that on the gold side so far. I mean, pretty wild when you look up at the price and you see you're like, oh, 1930. Geez, this is, I mean, especially as you pointed out and others uh, that above that 1920 high from 2011. Mm -hmm. So I think that's somewhat of an eye-opening level to many people. And silver, again, uh, ways off from its $50 highs from a couple of times. Yeah. But um, interesting, Jess, when you see gold as high as it as it is even while the fed is hiking and hasn't put an end point or official end date on that just yet although one thing in terms of the fed that i wanted to ask you about you had tom luongo on your show uh about a week or two ago yeah interesting conversation and tom certainly very well researched smart guy uh, and he's of the school of thought that and one of the few out there that especially in the gold and silver community that feels like they're just going to keep going. There is not going to be a pivot that they're mm -hmm. trying to bust up the ECB. Um, it was an interesting conversation. I'm curious uh, what your reactions were and has that changed your view after talking with him and, and what was your thoughts on what he was sharing there? Well, I, I first, I, yeah, Tom to he's an original uh, member of my site from uh, over a decade ago and a brilliant guy independent thinker and everybody needs as many independent thinkers as they can get their hands on this year. And so it was beneficial for me to talk to him too. Cause yeah, we don't necessarily agree on what the fed's going to do, but that doesn't mean I'm right. And he's wrong. So it was good to think about it. anybody. Can, again, just go to the tfmetalsreport.com, start scrolling down. You get, find a podcast with a big picture of a goat. And uh, that's the one it's free. Anybody can listen. And uh, Tom made some great points. I, I suppose uh, if inflation continues hot, uh, and, you know, doesn't start coming down or, you know, it already seemed like it was coming down last month, but if that stays up there, then maybe the Fed will keep doing what they're doing. I mean, hell, it was April of last year when Bill Dudley, the former head of the New York Fed said, you know, Fed's goal is to inflict losses on stock and bond investors, you know, hit the demand side of the demand curve, you know, the supply demand equation and get inflation down that way. Um, yeah, okay. Stock market got down 25% at one point, but you know, it's been coming back too. So maybe they haven't inflicted enough losses yet. Again, anything's possible. Um, and again, and, you know, and that leads me to this, Chris. I've, you know, I've had a couple podcasts that I've done in the last couple of weeks where people said, Hey, you know, what about gold going? Uh, gold needs to get washed out one more time. Gold needs to get, you know, before it can go up, it's got a lot of that to me is like trying to talk it into existence or cheerleading your position, but okay. What would, what would lead that to that act to actually happen? Well, you'd need the 10 year note to spike up to four and a half, five percent again from three and a half. Uh, you'd need the dollar to completely reverse and not only go back to one fourteen, but probably go to one twenty. Are those likely? No. Are they possible? Sure. Anything's possible but I don't think that they're likely. And so I don't expect that type of thing. Just, and that same thing kind of goes to what Tom was saying. Is it possible that the Fed could keep hiking? Sure. You know, regardless of what the economy is doing. Yeah. But I don't think it's likely. And again, and I've mentioned this a couple of times now, so maybe we should get into it. I, the analogous period to this year is 2010 and 2019, and they've shown their cards in the past. You know, everything changed in 2009, March 2009, when they started QE1. It was not a one-off. It was not, you know, oh, we're not monetizing the debt, as the Ben Bernanke said in front of Congress. That changed everything. You know, and now what? The Fed balance sheet went from a trillion to what? Nine trillion? And there's no going back. And so when they got called to the carpet in 2010, because the economy was rolling over, um, they cut and started QE2. When they got called to the carpet in 2019 because the economy was rolling over, they cut. And everybody was expecting rate hikes in 19 and said they started cutting uh, in uh, June of 19. And so I suspect, you know, when push comes to shove, you know, what other metaphors can I come up with? When we get down to brass tacks, um, they'll do the same. I mean, ultimately their goal, they got to keep the plate spinning, right? For their own power, you know, for everything, all the economic reasons to keep, people interested in, you know, keep the economy growing, whatever. And so if they're going to be forced to choose between 7% Fed funds or 
seeing the economy start to contract, you know, a two or three percent level GDP drop. Again, history shows and they're they're gonna choose on the side say tor- damn the torpedoes, we'll just turn the printers back on. And that's what I expect them to do. I think there's a lot of sense in that. And um, I'm in the same school of thought as well, where I guess there's no easy solution. Uh, perhaps would be going back to 2009 and not beginning the quantitative easing back then. And yeah, that doesn't leave an easy out. Although um, I'm curious, and I know uh, we promised not to make the title of this one. Craig Hemke says COMEX defaulting on this date, which uh, I know is not uh, your favorite when, when people use that headline. Although, how does this ultimately play out, especially we'll look at the silver side here where you saw the report last year that they're running record deficits. Even uh, CNBC, amazingly enough, was commenting the other day about the deficits, that they're expected deficits going forward. You know, we hear left and right, every electronic product in history is now using more silver how do you think this does ultimately play out? Because in addition, we've seen Ind- India set a silver import record of 304 million ounces. We're seeing LBMA and COMEX stockpile go down. What What do you yeah. think ultimately happens there? All right. One last thing on the prior topic for this one, because yeah. this is important. Uh, whether uh, we just say Tom's right or Craig's right, whether the Fed keeps hiking uh all through the year they start cutting it's not like a binary thing well the fed kept hiking and so we're just wrong the fed keeps hiking the longer they keep hiking just like when they didn't start hiking and inflation got out of control the the pendulum just swings that much farther the longer they wait to start cutting again the worse the economy is going to be and the greater the rate cuts in the qe are going to have to be so again, it's not like this binary thing. Well, they waited and now it's January, 2024. And we're, if they make it to January, 2024, then the amount of rate cuts in 24 are going to be outrageous. It's like the 75 basis point rate hikes they had to do last year. Okay. So it's important. That's that patient word. So it's not like if they delay, we're wrong and screwed. This is going to happen eventually, regardless. It's just a matter of how fast it has to happen. Okay, so that anyway, just to wrap up that other deal. Uh, another big part of that macro cast this year was what you're d- discussing, uh, metal inventories and stockpiles. In that uh, article that I wrote, there are a couple of charts I grabbed back in November and December showing physical metal stockpiles around the world. You know, we talk about, well, there's X amount of ounces leaving, leaving the comex of silver or whatever, and a little itty bitty slice of what's going on. I found charts of, yeah, that one, that's beautiful. You're the man. You see, Chris Marcus, you're the man. Um, yeah, look at that. Okay, Older, so what do we I, have here? Those are global Zoom stockpiles, trigger. right? That's of uh, LME base metal stockpiles. Okay, that's uh, copper, zinc, aluminum, lead, nickel, right? Look at, I mean, what does that chart tell you over the last 10 years? I saw another, there's another chart maybe below that. I can't remember. Of just silver? No, maybe not. Okay. Anyway, I just use that one. Um, there's another one I've seen of uh, uh, sil- or copper alone. I'm sorry, I should say copper alone. And I mean, again, we're not talking, this is not COMEX stockpiles. That's a combined chart, Shanghai and Lund, LME, COMEX, you know, every place else where there's above ground vaulted stocks. And it's it's dwindling. Um, Jim at Wall Street Silver uh, at Wall Street Silver put out had a chart in his Twitter feed earlier this week of zinc. No, nickel, yeah, one or the other. And it had been 300,000 metric tons in London five or six years ago. And now it's 20,000 metric tons, okay? Uh, the copper chart is is particularly interesting because uh, copper is, you know, obviously a very high demand as industrial metal. It's also been heavily leveraged. Yeah, there you go. It's been heavily leveraged in China. They use it as collateral uh, within their financial system for loans. But then it's also obviously, you know, this big battery metal, industrial metal, uh, infrastructure metal, that article you just put up about Trafigura or however you pronounce that, 
biggest commodity trader in the world, withdrawing vast amounts of copper from the LME, draw, drawing their stockpile down even further. Why? Well, because Trafigura knows that they're as a trader, they're on the hook for some future delivery of copper and they want to make sure that they can deliver it. So they're taking their copper off the exchange so they can have it themselves. It can't be reloaned out and rehypothecated, releveraged, so they can make future deliveries. Eh, there you go. So this is a big story. Um, and as this relates to the Comex silver in particular, or gold for that matter, kind of gets back. Remember we talked about palladium a couple of years ago, Chris? Yep. You know, um, all of these you markets. I thought that would be the, the one to watch that could spark. Yeah, still might be. Platinum might be. Who knows? They're all essentially the same, right? You've got a, a futures contract. Uh, or maybe it's a forward contract based out of London or a futures contract on the NYMEX or on the COMEX or whatever. And that thing fluctuates all over the place and is played with by speculators and bankers. But then you've got to flow physical metal into that price to make it be relevant. And so if suddenly I uh, pick one, nickel, copper, whatever, you just run out. Stock, the above ground stockpile is deleted and there's a problem and there's kind of a run and there's a force majeure or whatever. Somewhere, not on the COMEX, but somewhere. Does that trickle over? Does that trickle down? Whatever the right term is where people go, hey, wait a second. Hmm. If that happened in nickel, oh, maybe that's what could happen in silver too. And it's not just you and me then talking about this. It's actual people with legitimate money. <laughs> You know, that really uh, set off a crisis. So that base metal stuff is very important uh, to follow this year, especially with China coming back online, you know, finally getting rid of their zero COVID thing. You get that Chinese credit impulse, as we call it, to surge, and all of a sudden they're buying everything. Um, this could be a, outside of the Fed, outside of all that monetary policy mumbo jumbo. It could really be a big driver of commodities in general, and maybe even a crisis. So uh, not, as you said, uh, Craig Hemke says COMEX is going to default by Valentine's Day. No, it's not, man. Um, it's just not. But the crisis may emanate, you know, and begin, is likely to begin someplace else around the planet. And this is all, these are all trends that people got to watch, you know, like the Silver Institute, you know, supply demand issue that they put out. All these trends are staring you in the face. And if craziness happens later this year, then there will be people look back on it and go, yeah, I guess we should have seen that coming, huh? And because it's all right there looking at you if you look for it. Yeah, and like you point out, the signs are there. This is an article I've been referencing a couple of times. Saudi Arabia seeks 170 billion of mining investment by 2030. Yeah. Uh, here's another one I have up. Uh, Bank of Ghana buys 26,000 yeah. ounces of gold from Newmont, let alone whatever Russia and China are planning. Again, we don't know the exact timing of these things, but it seems like there's a lot more shifting towards the commodities and resources and away from yeah. some of the did, Western did, paper. Did you see the article yesterday on Reuters about Swiss exports mm -hmm. for 2022? Yeah. Again, Switzerland, you know, this hub of refiner, refining activity, right? They, It's not like they're selling their own gold because I don't think they have any anyway. Um, I don't, the 1,040 tons they have has been re-pledged and pledged through the biz. I don't think they got jack. What Swiss, they, they bring it in from the U.S. and other places, re, re you know, pour it out, recast it into 4.9 gold, and then ship it off to the East. They've been doing this for over a decade now. Net loss gold West East, right? People have written books about it. Um, however, just the most recent numbers of 2022, if you just add up their exports to China, Singapore, Thailand, and uh, Turkey, it's like 900 metric tons. 900 metric tons flowed into Switzerland and then out of Switzerland to just those four countries. That's one third of global mine supply. Yeah, you throw on India, whatever, on top of that. I mean, this is a huge drain. Of gold. Now you say, well, you know, there's a lot more out there, I guess. You know, every ounce that's ever been mined is out there someplace. But nonetheless, uh, that's a big, that that 
global sovereign demand uh, and then, you know, just global demand. Uh, that's a big story, too. Really big story for this year. Well, appreciate that you put the macro cast out there because you laid out a lot of these things. And yeah. so far, we're, you know, only a month into the year, but certainly seeing it reflected on the gold side and be interesting to follow silver as it goes along. And uh, a lot happening out there. And uh, of course, we don't know the exact timeline, but things that certainly are worth keeping an eye on that you keep an eye on every day. And perhaps in wrapping up, you could just let folks know where they can find your site and some of the great things you're doing there. Well, thank you, Chris. And thank you for being a part of the site. I I mean, that's how we met all those years ago, I think. Right. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's uh, that's what I do. I write a post every morning and I record a podcast every afternoon i tell people i'm kind of their eyes and ears so they can go about their lives and do other stuff and i'll tell you what's going on or maybe what you missed and plan accordingly you know because ultimately you know we're preparing for some type of monetary event um yeah, we've been preparing now for 12 years and i'm not saying that event is this year but we're preparing you know and then the community helps you to prepare so if you log, uh, where's the subscribe button? No, you don't get it because you're logged in. Uh, anyway, I if you go there, um, you, I'm reminded now that I, I set up a coupon, a coupon code back earlier this month to expire at the end of this month for all the times I've gone on to talk about the forecast. Anybody watching this, you want to kick the tires, see if there's any value to my site. The, sign up for a new monthly subscription, 15 one five dollars a month uh, at checkout put in the coupon coupon code 2023 and you get half off it'll cost you 750 uh for your first month if you stick around hey you got to pay full freight next month um but at least it's a way to find out if it's there's any value to what we do there um i think there is and i think the site you know the interaction you know uh, stop by maybe you'll see chris marcus there interacting um it gives you a chance to uh to learn a lot from people all over the world. Uh, we're all on the same team here, brother. Um, you know, we're not rooting for the end of, you know, the end of this uh, debt-based system because it ain't going to be fun when we get there, but we're all preparing for it. Yeah. And there's great value uh, in having a community like that. So tfmetalsreport.com, um, check us out. I think it's an important time to <clears throat> follow you. Follow Tom Luongo, as you said. Find as many independent sources of information that you can get. Be objective. Use your brains. Don't just listen to what CNBC is telling you. Use your own brains. Trust your instincts. And uh, prepare for a, wow, interesting couple of years to come. Yeah, and Craig, I really do appreciate your site because every morning it's nice to have your recap. You see a lot of the different things that are going on there. Great set of links whatever the latest PMI numbers are, which Fed governors are talking and yeah. saying about how they're going to raise rates to 300%. And and then we see the fall in the, the gold and silver prices, but it's a great column. And also the podcast in the afternoon for people to stay up to date on what's going on. So Craig, thanks for making some time to join me on the show. It's a pleasure to have you as always. And we'll have to check back in later this year and a couple of months and see how things are progressing then, although I, I think you're on the right track there and shaping up to be, uh, who knows, maybe the metals prices won't even wait till the second half of the year. I mean, they're, we're seeing it happen now already, and maybe the market's starting to sniff out what you've been writing. And who knows, maybe your buddy Jan Hatzius is a subscriber <laughs> and has fallen your comment. Uh, actually, there was uh, one last thing I would like to pull up here because I know you're a big fan of Goldman Sachs and even Goldman looking at superior total returns this year. So yeah, um, <clears throat> a lot of the banks now saying similar things to what you're suggesting. So um, appreciate all you're doing out there, Craig, and we'll look forward to catching up on all this again soon. Sounds good, brother. You take care of yourself, safe travels, and uh, have a shot at tequila for me, would you? Will do, my friend. Well, thank you to Craig. Always great to catch up with him and especially fun to go through his macro cast, which really is off to a pretty good start for what we've seen happen this year, especially as gold getting above 1940, at least as the time of this recording. Silver, still a little catching up to do, but hopefully we'll see some movement there soon as well. So thanks again to Craig, and also thank you to BlackRock Silver 
who had some results out Wednesday. They got the last assays from their 2022 drill campaign. And as you can see here, cuts 1.5 meters of 712 grams per ton silver equivalent at a new step out target. And that was within 4.36 meters grading 2.367 grams per ton gold, 162 grams per ton silver for a 399.3 grams per ton silver equivalent, which again suggests that they have a lot of expansion in their mineralization there outside of their mineral resource estimate that they released last April, which had just under 42 million ounces of silver equivalent. So good to see that they are growing the size of their project and they'll have some follow-up drilling going on throughout 2023. So congratulations to BlackRock. And to find out a little bit more about some of the recent developments with the company, well, there's a video with Andrew Pollard of BlackRock coming your way now.